our next panel is our investors panel with um, Jason Abruzzese from Mashable, as well as uh, two very well, uh, well-versed investors in the local space, Howard Morgan and Satish Dharmaraj from Redpoint Ventures. All right, well thanks guys for taking the time. I know that you're busy with your, your pitching schedules usually, and uh, uh, you know, since this is a venture capital thing, let's start off with um, you know, what are you guys hearing a lot of? What's the most common type of pitch coming across your desk in, in the local space right now? Well, we're, we're hearing a, a lot of local event discovery. You know, figure out where to hang out with your friends tonight. We probably see two a week. I mean, it's just uh, some better than others. Uh, you know, nothing that's, that's uh, been as compelling as we would have liked to see, but that's probably the most common local pitch we see. Yeah, I would agree. We see a lot of that, uh, what Howard just said. We also see a lot of Uber for X. Uh, we also see a lot of O to O, which is how do you get online to offline foot traffic into stores and what techniques you use to do that. Sure. And uh, do people come, actually come in with the pitch, we want to be Uber for this thing? Is that actually a phrase that you For use? sure. Oh, okay. They do, and, and uh, because first round was the, was the seed investor in Uber, uh, my usual response is, Okay, so you mean you're going to be used four times a day, you know, every day of the week, and they usually say, no, 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 and well, how often, you know, well, maybe once a month, but but it'll, you know, but it'll be on demand, and uh, you know, that's yeah, not that's, Uber. <laughs> that's a common fallacy. I would agree. The other thing is the transaction. The Uber transaction is frictionless, right? There's no third party involved, unlike a restaurant, like a food delivery service. All of a sudden, you have a restaurant and they get your order wrong, or your food is cold, or the, the delivery guy gets stuck in traffic. I mean, so many other issues, which, which is a friction-filled transaction, mm -hmm. and that's the cool thing about Uber. Sure. Um, so, Kevin, you said Uber for X is, is a common one. Um, certainly within locality, I think we see, like you said, you know, events is one, you know, transportation another, food's another. What, what areas do you find are just completely saturated? I mean, at what point, are you starting to hear topics and you're just immediately turning off, like, no, this is not going to work? We never turn anything immediately off because uh, entrepreneurs come up with new twists and some of them re really click. Uh, I, I would say most things that involve selling to uh, the SMB market or the small local market, mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to be a directory for, a local directory for X. That usually is a pretty quick pass unless there's something awfully compelling about it because there are enough of them, uh, Yelp obviously, but uh, you know, also Angie's List and all those kind of things. So when we see another one of those, we say, okay, what's, what's unique? What's the real twist? And frankly, most of them don't have a, a, a difference. We see a lot in the food delivery space. I think that is oversaturated. Um, you know, everyone trying to do food delivery, you know, different twist on food delivery. Uh, concierge services, there's a lot of them. There's not a clear winner that's emerged. Uh, it's dangerous to turn off an entire sector uh, in the venture capital industry. I mean, sure. <laughs> what do we know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, we can't, you know, redline a whole sector. But uh, if you ask me, are those uh, particular things saturated? Absolutely. I think there's like dozens of startups in, in concierge services and food delivery. And, and I'm sure one of them will emerge with the right business model and, and you know, and and sure. we got to just wait for that. And it, it, you know, it seems like, you know, we've talked about mostly, you know, kind of consumer facing companies, the Ubers, the Yelps that, you know, attain these big valuations and, you know, their founders are on the covers of magazines. But it also seems like there's a lot of desire from big businesses, you know, that are existing for location services. B2B, maybe not as sexy, but is, do you see more opportunities there? And are you guys, you know, actively hearing, you know, good pitches in that area? Well, we see a lot of B2B to C. I mean, for Uber Rush, for example, the package delivery is a B2B serv uh, service in some sense because mo many of the packages are going to other businesses. So we see, we see that kind of uh, B2B to C quite a lot. And, uh, and then we see a lot of marketplace enabling things for businesses. Uh, so um, uh, pizza delivery, you know, and, and being able to enable the merchants. We have Zoomer in our portfolio, which has sort of taken, takes over the delivery problem for a lot of local restaurants. Sure. And that's a B2B sale, even though the, the delivery ends up at a consumer. Sure. And Satish, you were, you were saying before we got on the stage, actually, you were talking about a, uh, 
a startup that just helps you sell your car. That's not reinventing the wheel. That sounds like something that's existed for a while, but why is that working with like a local flavor to it? Right, uh, and that startup is BP. Uh, it's one of our investments. And the idea there is that, you know, uh, if you want to go sell your car, you know, or buy a car, but you want a relatively new car, like you want a, an experience like as though you're walking into a dealer. The idea there is that, you know, it's so much easier and better if you have a mobile phone to request a car, uh, request that you want to sell your car and BP sends people, do your car inspection, gives you, gives you a price on the spot. And then they do all the back end work of listing the car for, service, for, for sale, uh, you know, detailing the car, and then delivering the car with an inspection to, to, to the buyer. I think uh, basically what has happened in recent times is there's a lot more trust amongst consumers, honestly, that such services uh, can be enabled uh, and it's local. And if you give an experience that is well beyond what you would otherwise expect in, a, in an offline model, which by offline I mean going to a car dealership, you're able to uh, give enough excitement and enough delight that it spreads. Yeah, I mean, we see something like that with, all, with dog vacay, which uh, is uh, where you either need uh, to put your dog uh, you know, away, you're going away for a week and you need to, to have the dog stay somewhere, uh, or you need dog walking, which we have in a few cities now. Uh, and if that first, in, and the in interaction is a delight, people come back over and over because the app makes it so easy to just do again what, what you did for me last time. Now, is that on-demand labor, or is that kind of connecting dog people with dog care centers? Uh, it's connecting people with, it, with, with, it's a marketplace, in essence. So we have people who are vetted and insured to do dog sitting who come on the marketplace. We have people who say, I, I need a dog sitter for the, for the next three days. And we create a couple of matches, and maybe two or, two or three of the, the uh, sitters will come out and give you an offer. And sometimes they want to see the dog, if it's a big dog in particular. Uh, sometimes they don't, but it, but but the whole experience is that once you've done it, the next time it's, I like that. If the same sitter is available, give me that same sitter, and it, it's click click and done. So it sounds like a lot of these are, are a little service based, whether it's dog walking, helping you sell your car. Um, it, it seems like one of the, the big ones, uh, Airbnb, found kind of this unused inventory, which was just basically room and figured out a way to monetize it. Are you hearing any pitches like that? I, I, I kind of like find that to be a very interesting idea. Is there any Airbnbs for X? Well, we have Flight Car. Uh, Flight yeah. Car picked up some unused inventory, yeah. which is when your car is sitting in the parking lot at the airport. And then why don't, rather than paying $20 a day for parking or much more out here at Kennedy, uh, why not let us rent it out, clean, clean it for you, rent it out for the six days you're away, bring, give it back, give you half that rental price, mm -hmm you know, no, no parking fee, and we'll pick you back up at the airport when you come back. That is uh, expanded now into a large number of cities. So that's an unused inventory play. And, and we're seeing others come in in different areas where people have, you know, it's basically the sharing economy, as, as people are calling it. And if you have an a assets that are un underutilized uh, and they're easily shareable, uh, then, then that works. It doesn't work for everything. Yeah, I mean, we have, uh, we have an investment in a company called Lux, which does the same thing for parking spots. Um, you know, they, it's an on-demand valet, and they uh, buy out an entire parking lot, uh, lease it out, and then use the inventory, you know, uh, by, by an algorithm. So, uh, yeah, we're seeing a lot of that, and we're seeing a lot of success in that. If you can find the right kind of asset class where that, it lends itself to that, then I think, and it'd be frictionless, then I think there is, uh, there is a lot more chances for it to succeed than otherwise. And, and it doesn't have to always be local. Rent the one way, uh, I was obviously doing that nationally yeah. with dresses. Uh, we, have, we have the Black Tux, which is doing that for tuxedo rentals. Mm -hmm. uh, and the economics of the tuxedo rental business are insane, which is yeah. to say, you buy a tuxedo, the best, even the best ones you buy are you know, one or $200, and yeah. they get rented out multiple times, that is more than 10 times. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, actually the best example of unused inventory uh, for, for sale is actually the cloud. If you think about AWS, what they do is they take unused compute power and unused storage power and then rent it out when people are not using it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to do before we open up the floor to questions is I think we've seen one of the, the, 
big topics in the last month or so has been kind of this late stage investing, people talking about, you know, has some of the market gotten a little ahead of itself. As far as local startups, you know, obviously Uber, Airbnb are two of the biggest. Um, are you still seeing an appetite? You know, do you guys still have an appetite to find new companies? Do you still see that, you know, this is a good VC market or, or is it, are people starting to slow down a little bit? I think valuations are starting to, to you know, people are being a little more careful about valuations. But, you know, good companies, great companies uh, always have a market. Uh, you know, we, we started in 05 at first round when the markets were really awful. We made some great investments in those years. So I, I don't think people are slowing down so much as being a little more rational about valuation when they see what the public markets do to a zoo lily or something like that. I would say that uh, for early stage investing, I think uh, it's still really, really an exciting time uh, for venture. Um, we see a lot of disruptions happening, local being a big one. Um, but I think uh, if you look at the growth stages, I do agree that you know private valuations have far eclipsed the public markets, and that's pretty clear if you just do the multiple math. I mean, it's so obvious. Um, so you s we're already seeing, I think, We've, we've seen for the last year and last six months for sure uh, kind of slowing down on the growth side of things. And I think that will continue as you see a lot of the hedge funds and a lot of the New York public guys investing in venture. Uh, as they, you know, pull back a little bit, uh, you'll see that the growth valuations will actually come down and mm -hmm. growth price, there'll be pressure on growth pricing, which is actually a good thing uh, and, and overall for the sure. industry. And I guess kind of like going off of that, like there still seem to be some opportunities, some being overseas, like just because, uh, you know, that's far away doesn't mean local's not going to work there. I mean, talk about, we were talking backstage a little bit, you're telling me that the, the car, you know, car sales service works well in China. Yeah. I mean, so we, uh, we invest uh, typically about 15 to 20 percent of our fund in China, and once we find something working here, like the used car uh, idea, we had the same thing. Uh, we invest in the same kind of a company in China, and it's growing really fast. Um, but, you know, uh, there's so much opportunity back in our backyard right now. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, we go out looking for uh, things outside. Uh, but if we see something working and we see an opportunity, then we do it. Yeah, First Round does not uh, typically invest outside the U.S., although we, there are a lot of technical teams. We have a bunch in Israel and a bunch in places like Buenos Aires, we, a new one in, uh, a new hot spot seems to be Macedonia. We've got three companies that now have their tech teams in Macedonia. So, I mean, there's a lot of well-educated people all over the world uh, that are well-educated software developers, and most of them uh, have learned English as well. So, uh, we're seeing that, but as far as the marketplaces, for us, we're, we're just focused in the U.S. Yeah. And so maybe, so don't believe the hype too much, especially when it comes to local. There's, there are still opportunities. You still see it as a as a relatively active VC market. Yeah, I would say so. Very active here. But I do think there, you know, geographies like India are just starting to explode yeah. as smartphone usage get, as smartphones get, you know, under $100, that, that stuff explodes. Okay. Excellent. Well, I mean, I think that people out here probably have much better questions than I did. Um, anybody? Anybody want to uh, float one? We got one back there. Do we have any mics? Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, really excited to be here. First round at Redpoint are huge inspirations of mine. Uh, another one of my inspirations is here today. Uh, he's a partner at Google. He was kind enough to hook me up with this ticket. And he told me the best piece of advice I ever got was uh, when you want something, go big and ask for something bigger. So I was wondering if I could get 15 minutes of either one of your time after this. <laughs> I love the hustle. <laughs> Well, we, the way we do it is very simple. Uh, you know, we, uh, Howard at first round, and be just, we're, we're completely open, we'll look at everything. Uh, we may not go much further than that. Well, I'll send you my deck and ask again later. So, thanks again. Thanks, guys. I'll wait for, I'll wait for Howard to invest and I'll follow <laughs> up. I mean, my job, as you, you should understand my job, first round looks at about 5,000 deals a year and does 1% of them. So, so my job is to be saying no, but in a way that's in some way encouraging or, or helpful so that when you have the next idea, which could be the next Uber, you'll still come back to me. And I look at the one person of the deals he does. <laughs> okay.
you spoke about a number of the concepts that you're seeing lots of or too much of. Um, are there categories that you haven't seen much of that you wish you, you saw? Well, not so much in the, we're seeing a lot of uh, enterprise software things come, you know, we're, we're kind of the next level if, after Workday. You know, first there was Salesforce, then there was Workday. We're seeing the cloudification of most of American business, large business, and uh, there's a lot more to be done there. We have uh, Kentic and the network man tools management. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening in that, and we're, we're, we think there's a lot more room in that. Um, you know, when you see an announcement like General Electric saying, they're not going to run their own servers at all. They're going to go completely cloud over the next 10 years. That, that's a pretty big marketplace to this opening up. And it's not just the Amazon hardware piece, but lots of pieces of software to manage that and so on. Yeah, I, we do see a lot in all the sectors, enterprise and SaaS and Internet of Things and wearables and uh, local. But the key thing there is that's a really hard question to answer because what are we not seeing? We're always looking for the black. We don't know what we, what we don't know. And so we don't know that there is a black swan un until this one emerges, right? So uh, we're always looking for the black swan. So I, don't know. I, I do think Internet of Things. So we have a company called Augury, which is based here in New York and in Haifa, Israel, that listens to HVAC systems and predicts failures. And so it helps people predict failures. And it turns out that's a local business because most of the HVAC repair people, even for big buildings, are a bunch of local businesses that sometimes get, there's some big players like Johnson Controls who we're working with, but then there's a lot of smaller players. And so it involves really figuring out how do you sell in that local area. I can guarantee if you come up with a way to predict my mom's house's problems before they happen, she will use that business. <laughs> that is absolutely something. Yep. Any others? One that I just want to touch on before we only got a few minutes left is, is kind of the, the beacon system and, and how granularly you can kind of track people in an anonymous way, hopefully mostly. Um, where is that heading? Because that's to me one of the most interesting areas. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I honestly think beacon right now today is overhyped. And, and here's why. No one even, I mean, how many people here have gotten a beacon based alert? You got to go to your settings, privacy, uh, location-based services, then go to system services and then turn on location alerts and location ads. And then you have to go and download the Target app or whatever app the retail store has. And then Target has to install a beacon system and all of that has to come together before you get a beacon-based alert. I mean, it's so friction-filled that I think that the state of the art right now, that's not going to scale and that's not going to work. It's got to, it's got to get into the operating system. iOS and Apple has to start you know, integrating beacon alerts as part of its OS for it to really, really become mass market and scalable. Consumers otherwise have no idea, you know, that this even exists. On the other hand, uh, you know, we, we've had investments in companies that, that providing information to businesses is usually available, and there are some privacy considerations that the FTC has worked on, but, uh, you know, we, your, your cell phone and its ESN is being broadcast all the time. So we don't know that it's satitious, but we know that at ESN 1275, say whatever, you know, has walk, is walking by, by my store. We know that he How stopped. How is creepy? We know that he stopped in front of in front of this particular window display. We know that he's walked in. We actually know that 11 percent of the people who stopped at that display walked in, and half of those then walked over to the specific rack that had that item and then so there's a huge amount of market intelligence systems in the aggregate but it's not you know uh, they don't know who the specific consumer is that's happening because of beacons even though uh, and I completely agree with Satish the the, the notion of the beacons uh, giving us individual alerts is not great but telling stores this guy who walked in has been in front of your store five times in the last week Maybe he's ready to buy now. Maybe send a salesperson over as they're walking into the store. We don't know his name. We don't know who he is. But he seems to like that jacket. That's terrifying. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to TJ and Howard. This has been excellent. It was great talking to you guys. Thanks thank so much. You. Thank you.